Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 18, Belarus. We go back to Europe and back to talking about alcohol. This week, I made Krambambulia, a Belarusian honey-infused vodka with a whole bunch of spices. It was formerly a drink for just the nobility in the 18th century, but now anyone can make it at home. I had it fermented in my closet for about a week, and trying it out, it was pretty good. Although, finding all the spices needed for it was a little bit of a hassle, and everyone says it looks like piss. But enough of my piss drink, let's talk about Belarus. The Republic of Belarus is located in Eastern Europe. It has Russia to the east of it, Ukraine to the south, Poland to the west, and Lithuania and Latvia to the northwest. Climate-wise, the country has a cold continental climate. This means winters see a lot of snow, while summers have a fairly moderate temperature. Much of Belarus is flat and forested, with marshes present in the south and east of the country. Also, they have some of the last remaining Eurasian bison left in Europe, so that's pretty cool. Population-wise, Belarus has around 9.4 million people. Most people in the country are ethnically Belarusian, a Slavic people. Around 85% of the country is Belarusian, with the south and center of the country having the highest concentration. The next largest ethnic group are Russians, with many settling in the north of the country along the border. Around 7.5% of the population is Russian. After that, you have 3.1% of the population being Polish, mainly found along the Lithuanian and northern Polish border. 1.7% are Ukrainian, found in the southwest corner of the country, along with smaller groups of Jews, Armenians, and Tartars. Now, language-wise, you would expect to see Belarusian, an East Slavic language, spoken by the vast majority of the population. However, only 26% of the population will actually speak Belarusian at home. Instead, most people will speak Russian, with 70% of the population using that as a first language. We'll get into why that is later in the episode, but right now know that Belarusian is common in rural areas of the country, while Russian is more popular in urban areas. Also, both Belarusian and Russian are official languages of the country, and many people in the country can speak both. Religion-wise, the country is mostly Christian, with over 80% following some form of Christianity. The largest branch of Christianity is Eastern Orthodoxy, with most specifically following the Russian Orthodoxy. Around 83% of the country is Eastern Orthodox. After that, you have a large Catholic minority, with around 6-7% being Catholic. The Catholic community is divided between Latin Catholics, who are mostly Poles, Lithuanians, and to a lesser extent Belarusians, and Greek Eastern Catholics, who are mostly Belarusian and Ukrainian. Besides Orthodoxy and Catholicism, you also have smaller groups of Protestants, Seventh-day Adventists, Muslims, Buddhists, and Jews. Irreligion is also fairly widespread in the country. They make up a wide range of the population, between 3 to 40 percent of the country. Belarus in antiquity was often passed through by pastoral people moving into Europe. You had early Indo-Europeans, Scythians, Huns, Avars, and Baltic people all settle in Belarus at some point. By the 5th century CE, Slavic people would begin to permanently settle in the region, mixing with the local Baltic people nearby. Starting in the late 9th century, Belarusian tribes would join with other Slavic tribes in Ukraine and Russia to form the Kievan Rus state and convert it to Orthodox Christianity. This state was based around the city of Kiev in Ukraine, and was almost a quasi-federation, with many states holding a large degree of autonomy. This would include the Principality of Polsk, centered in Belarus. Polsk would grow, holding quasi-independence until the 10th century. It would become an important city religiously, with several large churches being formed in the city, and held political control over much of the Baltic tribes in the region. Conflict with other Slavic states would see a decline starting in the mid-10th century. While most Slavic states would suffer from the Mongol invasions into Europe, Belarus was mostly spared and ended up under the control of the Lithuanians. The Grand Duchy of Lithuania emerged on the scene taking huge sections of Eastern Europe. The Lithuanians were at first pagans, but would convert to Catholicism in 1387. However, most Slavs in the region were able to keep their Orthodox faith, and were largely independent. By this time, most Slavs in Lithuania were speaking what is known as Ruthenian. This language would later evolve into Belarusian, Ukrainian, and Rusin. But for now, no, it is spoken throughout Lithuanian land, and became closely mixed with the Lithuanian language, which I should mention now as a Baltic language. 
meaning it's fairly different from most Slavic languages, but not incredibly far away from them. Think of it like the relation between English and French. Lithuanian rule would see most of the Ruthenian speakers holding fairly close and loyal ties with their Lithuanian rulers. Many regions of the duchy would be fairly multi-ethnic by today's standards, and many Slavic lords and peasants would aid the Lithuanians from fighting off rival Germans and Russian rulers. Minsk, the current capital of the country, would start to grow at this time. In 1569, Lithuania and Poland would merge together, forming the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The merger of the two states would lead to Polish control over Belarus, and see an increased number of Poles and Lithuanians entering the territory. Many would serve as lords over the Ruthidian peasants. It is said that many noblemen would speak Lithuanian with their family, Polish with their friends and political counterparts, and Ruthenian with their serfs. Polish rule would also see a large number of Jews and other ethnic groups enter the region, as Belarus became more and more integrated with Poland and the rest of Europe. Polish rule would see a religious transformation in Belarus. While the Poles are Catholic like Lithuanians and, officially, freedom of religion was respected, Polish rulers and Catholic priests sought to gain a further foothold in the region. In 1597, several Orthodox priests decided to rejoin the Catholic Church, forming the Belarusian Greek Catholic Church. This church was used to try and Polonize the region, making it easier to manage and control the Slavic population. Many lords were encouraged to speak Polish more and more, and by the 17th century, Belarusian, which had now emerged from the Ruthenian language, was largely relegated to the rural countryside, and was considered backwards. Speaking Belarusian was pretty much the Slavic equivalent of speaking with a redneck accent and chewing dip. During this time, Russia had begun to emerge as a powerful state in Eastern Europe, with the Tsars and Moscow coming into conflict with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The eastern edge of Belarus began to see more and more conflict, until 1655 when the Russians invaded. The Commonwealth was also suffering from revolts in Ukraine and an invasion from Sweden, resulting in the Poles largely unable to halt the Russian advance. The Russians occupied and looted much of modern-day Belarus, pillaging everywhere they went. By the time the Russians had left in 1660, around one-third of the entire Commonwealth had died. The Commonwealth lost its status as an important player in Eastern Europe, and entered into a death spiral. Belarus would fall under Russian rule in the partitions of Poland. Russian rule would see a counter to Polonization, with instead Russification. While at the start of Russian rule, almost 80% of the population was Eastern Catholic. It would shift greatly towards becoming Eastern Orthodox, with the Russian Orthodox Church being granted special privileges. The Russian language was also used in business, politics, and average street life in the cities. These policies would lead to several revolts, which were mostly fought in the name of restoring the old Commonwealth. As many Poles and Lithuanians found themselves on Russian land, these revolts saw the Poles, Lithuanians, and Belarusians all joining together to try to throw off Russian rule. These revolts would all result in failure, however. The January Uprising of 1863 will be the last revolt to take place in the former Commonwealth land, with most Polish elites being forced out and many realizing that throwing off Russian rule would require a different approach. As nationalism swept throughout much of Europe, Polish and Lithuanian nationalists sought to try and recruit people to secretive nationalist organizations, promoting an independent Polish or Lithuanian state. Now there were some Belarusians who tried to argue for an independent Belarusian state, but they struggled to gain traction, some of the main reasons for this was they had to compete with Polish nationalists, Lithuanian nationalists, socialists, and Jewish Zionists for recruits. All of these groups had overlapping and widely divergent claims over the same territory, often arguing that Belarusian peasants could belong and join any of their groups. The Belarusian nationalists also struggled with projecting themselves widely, while the Poles had a large emigre population that would support them with funds and propaganda, and the Lithuanians were able to hide behind their Baltic language, the Belarusians were largely rural, and struggled to build a support system. Because Belarus was so close with Russia and the Russian language, which is also an East Slavic language, it allowed Russian authorities an easier time integrating Belarusian peasants into Russian society. This helped stamp out nationalist sympathies and led most anti-Russian forces to join with either Polish or Lithuanian groups. World War I and the post-war turmoil would see a surge of Belarusian culture. Most of Belarus had been captured by the Germans in 1918, after the defeat of a Russian Tsar state. The Germans, while occupying the region, allowed Belarusian language a wide degree of use. 
The Germans have encouraged this surge in Belarusian identity in the hopes of building up puppet states in the region that would serve as a buffer between Russia and Germany. In the context of a communist advance from the east, the Belarusian People's Republic was formed in March of 1918. This republic was created to serve as a socialist state that encouraged multiculturalism between the Belarusians, Poles, and Lithuanians. However, this state wouldn't last long, as by 1919 all of Belarus would fall under Soviet control. The government of this failed state wouldn't disappear, however. At first, they fled to Lithuania before fleeing to Prague, Paris, and eventually Canada. The Rada today still operates as a government in exile, claiming to be the sole legitimate Belarusian government. It is the oldest government in exile in the world today. So with most of Belarus in Soviet hands, the Soviets formed the Lithuanian Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. This republic would serve as a Soviet puppet state in Belarus and Lithuania, and push west to spread the global communist revolution. The Soviet advance would push deep into Poland and Lithuania, but would be halted at Warsaw. The Soviets would be driven back and ended up losing all of its Lithuanian territory and half of Belarus to the Poles. By 1921, the Soviet half had formed the new Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, while the Polish half would form what is now known as Zagodnaya Belarus, or Western Belarus. The Soviet half of the country saw Belarusian culture actually prosper during its initial years. The Soviets hoped that by allowing Belarusian to flourish, they could gain the loyalty of the Belarusians, and possibly set the stage for future enlargement into Polish Belarus. The Soviet authorities went to work, trying to build up the country which had been devastated by war and banditry. The Soviets would build universities and schools in the country, and promote the Belarusian language to help educate the population. They would also redistribute the land to better help local peasants, and began building up the country's economy and infrastructure. Meanwhile, in Polish Belarus, the Poles had decided to counter the Soviets' attempts to appease the Belarusians by attempting to squash the Belarusians out. Thousands of Polish veterans would move into the region, after being promised farmland by the Polish government. Belarusian-speaking schools and Orthodox churches were shut down, and Polish was encouraged in day-to-day -day life. Some Belarusians, with covert backing from the Soviets, sought to fight the Poles through propaganda or sabotage, but very few Belarusians would participate in anti-Polish activities. Going back to Soviet Belarus, things in the late 20s were starting to look not very good for the Belarusians. This new guy from Georgia became the head of the Soviet Union, named Joseph Stalin. And I mean, I hope he does nothing bad in world history. Surely he'll go down as a hero. However, at least in Belarus, he certainly was not an angel. He reversed many of the policies giving Belarusians greater autonomy, and began cracking down on anyone who expressed strong ethnic sentiments, and could possibly challenge Soviet rule. This would mainly end up being educated Belarusians, priests, and the Polish community living in the country. In one famous mass grave outside Minsk, Somewhere between 30,000 and 250,000 are believed to be buried. Russians were brought into the country to fill leadership positions, and Belarusian returned to being the peasant's language. World War II would see massive devastation for the country. First, Belarus was reunited under the Soviets when the USSR invaded eastern Poland, supported by Nazi Germany, who also invaded Poland, in what both countries hoped would be an alliance that would last for a very long time. The Nazi and Soviet alliance would break apart a little under two years later. The Nazis took control of most of the country by August 1941, and would occupy the country setting up a military government in the region that was characterized by massacres, pillaging, and violence. Belarus was famous for being a hotbed in resistance activity, with thousands of Belarusians taking up arms to wage guerrilla war against the Germans. These resistance fighters fought for a variety of reasons, most were communists, or at least loyal enough to the Soviet Union, to disrupt German supply lines in the hopes that one day the Soviet army would retake Belarus. However, you also saw Belarusian nationalists fighting for an independent Belarus against all non-Belarusians. There were Poles fighting for Belarus to rejoin Poland, against both the Nazi occupiers and the Soviet partisans, seeing them just as bad as the Nazis, considering that the Soviets did invade their country. You would also see a large percentage of partisans coming from the Jewish community, who had to fight to try and save their community from extermination from the Nazis. The war would see brutal repression and extrajudicial killing from both sides. Show trials and massacres of civilians became a common feature of partisan activity in Belarus. In order to try and gain support from the Belarusians, the Nazis set up a puppet government known as the Belarusian Central Rada. The Rada was controlled and its leaders were picked by the Nazis, 
while they in turn helped the Nazis fight off the partisans and control the population. The war would see around one-fourth to one-third of the entire population of Belarus lost. The Jewish community in particular was hit hard, with almost 66% of the population being killed, with many of those who survived fleeing to other parts of the USSR or to Israel after the war. In 1944, the Soviets would retake Belarus from the fleeing Germans. After the war, the Soviets were forced to rebuild the country from scratch. Factories and cities were rebuilt across the country, and slowly the economy of the country began to grow. Belarus would become a manufacturing center by the 50s, and the urban population grew as more Belarusians moved into the cities, and Russians from Russia itself moved into the country looking for jobs. Belarus, for the most part, would experience relative prosperity during this time. However, as the years went by, more and more people began to become critical of Soviet rule. This would increase in 1986 with the Chernobyl disaster. While the Chernobyl nuclear plant had been located in Ukraine, it was close enough to the border and the radiation would affect such a wide area that much of southeastern Belarus became affected. Around 22,000 people had to flee their homes, with many who lived in the region suffering even today from cancer and unknown diseases. Today, there is still an 800-mile large exclusion zone, where nobody is allowed to live, and radiation is closely monitored. The disaster will become an important symbol for Soviet incompetence, and the emerging anti-Soviet pro-democracy opposition began to criticize the country's leadership. With more opposition to communist rule across the Soviet Union, many in Belarus began to realize Soviet rule was coming to an end. The Belarusian Popular Front and other opposition groups began to protest using the old Belarusian People's Republic flag, demanding democracy, fair elections, the right to protest, and the Belarusian language to be promoted. Elections in 1990 would see the opposition win a decent number of seats, although not a majority, and in July of that year, Belarus would declare independence, although it wouldn't be fully independent until a year later. The first leader of the country would be Stanislav Shukhevich. He would slowly begin reforming the country away from communist rule, and slowly introducing capitalism into the country. He would, in 1994, help sign the new Belarusian constitution into law, that on paper gave the country a very similar political structure to Russia, giving the president a large degree of power, with fair elections and the right to assemble. Presidential elections will be held later in the year, with Alexander Lukashenko winning 80% of the vote in the second round of the election. Now, if there is anyone you know about from Belarus, or really know anything about the country, it's probably Lukashenko. He is the first and only official Belarusian president, and has played an incredibly important role in shaping the development of the country. Lukashenko has used the state to intervene in the economy to reduce unemployment, and encourage Belarusian industries to stay afloat. While Belarus under Lukashenko is certainly not the richest country in Europe, it does have decent wages and a low level of unemployment, with Lukashenko being closely credited for keeping the economy going in the country. However, Belarus is also often called the last dictatorship in Europe, with Lukashenko regularly cracking down on anyone who opposes him. While the 1994 election is generally considered to have been fair, Every election since then has been noted with difficulty in registering as a candidate for opposition members, arrest, and government forces mysteriously winning almost every time. Lukashenko has used his power as president to gain even greater power, with him ruling the country with almost no checks on his power. He has then used this influence to enrich himself, his family, and his supporters. Opposition activists are often beaten in the streets if they protest, and forced disappearances aren't uncommon. Belarus is often looked at as a Russian puppet state, with Belarus often siding with Russia in international affairs and holds close economic relations. Belarus is currently in what is now known as a Union State, which was signed in 1999. This was originally going to join Belarus and Russia together as one joint confederation. Russian is still widely used in the country, and Lukashenko has several times strongly encouraged pride in Soviet rule, encouraged the Russian language, and even talked of merging the two states together. However, to say that Belarus is simply a lapdog of Russia is wrong. The Union State, for example, failed to bring the two states together into one country, due to disagreements with the two countries' lawmakers. The country has several times engaged in energy and trade wars between the two, most famously in the Milk War in 2009. Russia encouraged the privatization of the Belarusian milk industry, and allegedly attempted to bribe the country into recognizing Abkhazia and South Ossetia as legitimate states. This resulted in Belarus entering in talks with the EU to increase relations resulting in a trade war. 
Lukashenko has also at several times attempted to promote the Belarusian language as a counter to Russia's influence in the country, and even in early 2020, accused Russia of trying to annex the country. Lukashenko is also apparently a pretty good hockey player, and regularly plays hockey with his own team. I guess you could say he's pretty good at skating around his relations with Russia. But not everyone in Belarus is impressed with Lukashenko's hockey performance, or my bad puns, with a significant opposition present in the country. While the opposition regularly has to deal with crackdowns and has difficulty gaining traction in the country, this still remains a very dedicated subset of the population who opposes the government. This opposition regularly holds speeches, denouncing the Lukashenko government and its ties with Russia. They often demand greater rights for the Belarusian language, an actual meaningful separation of powers, and self-determination. They often are made up of a coalition of Belarusian nationalists, liberals, feminists, the younger generation, to some extent socialist and other Marxist groups, anarchists, and some Poles in the country. While Lukashenko as president holds most of the power in the country, there are still other political institutions in the country, although they all remain subservient to him. The prime minister of the country, Roland Golovchenko, manages the government for the president and helps carry out Lukashenko's policies. He is backed by the National Assembly, the legislature of the country. While there is no dominant political party that runs the country, several pro-government parties are present that back the government. These pro-government forces are usually a collection of conservatives, communists, pro-government socialists, and Russian nationalists. During the COVID pandemic, increasing opposition emerged around Lukashenko. He was accused by the opposition of downplaying the pandemic and not doing enough. In 2020, the country had presidential elections, with the opposition rallying around Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. Tikhonovskaya was a teacher and wife to a prominent opposition activist. When he was arrested, she decided to run for president, basing her campaign around the idea of freeing political prisoners, setting up term limits, and promoting small startups more. When the election happened, Lukashenko won 80% of the vote, to Tikhonovskaya's 10%. Except, that's not what Tikhonovskaya claimed the results were. She instead claimed to have won 60-70% to 70 of the vote. She fled the country after initially being detained, and began claiming to be the legitimate representative of the country. This resulted in massive protest in the country, as pro-opposition supporters flooded the streets and took to protesting. The protests are believed to have somewhere between 10,000 to 500,000 people turn up to protest for Tikhonovskaya. The government has reacted by cracking down on the protests, with tens of thousands being arrested, many being beaten or tear gassed, and over four people dying. While the protests are still ongoing, it has tapered off in 2021, with protester fatigue setting in. Internationally, the EU, America, most of Latin America, and other pro-Western states back the protest while Russia, China, and other pro-Russian countries oppose the protest. Russia has promised to aid Lukashenko should he ever need it. The Russian government doesn't want to lose an ally right on its border, and are concerned that it could lead to protesters in Russia, who are often ideologically aligned with those in Belarus, and tend to argue over the same reasons, to be fully invigorated, and to give them hope. So why does Belarus exist? I read an interesting fact about the country while researching the episode. A poll found that 80% of the country would strongly oppose Russia sending its army to annex it. But that same poll also showed that the same number of Belarusians wouldn't do anything about it, except maybe complain to their family and friends. Many Belarusians are quite frankly apathetic to the situation around them, and this has led to other states and people to dictate what happens to them. Many Belarusians, it seems, don't have a strong sense of agency, and this has allowed strong men like Lukashenko to come in and essentially dictate what happens to the country and make the country all around him. Is Belarus more than just Lukashenko? That's something we'll have to find out when he leaves the country, whether that is tomorrow or 50 years from now. Next week, we go west to Belgium. Prepare for a country that seemingly no one wants to be in, an incredibly complicated political system, a dark history of colonialism, and pretty good waffles. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed. So yeah, there's Belarus. Um, I think my next episode will be a continuation on the British Overseas Territories, and then I'll do an episode talking about um, some of the smaller Australian political parties. That video on YouTube has kind of blown up 2,000 views right now, so that's pretty cool. Um, for some reason, I never expected I would get 2,000 views on that video. Yeah, and then after that, I'll work on Belgium. 
thank you for listening. I appreciate it. If you want to email me, you can email me at why do countries exist at gmail.com for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Thank you. Take care. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. The sources I use for this video are ABC's news report, Belarus ongoing protests examined, Associated Press report, in Belarus, protesters showed pride, worry, empathy, Belarus's feeds video, life at the Belarus-Russian border, Caspian reports videos, are Belarus and Russia parting ways, and when Belarus tried to annex Russia, David Marvel's book, Lukashenko's Belarus and the Great Patriotic War, Geography Now's video, Belarus, Hetmanopedia's video, Why Belarus is Not White Russia, History Hustle's video, When Belarus Failed to Gain Independence, John Posse's video, Abandoned Jewish Cemetery in Belarus, Knowledgepedia's video, Why Belarus is a Country, Mr. History's video, A Super Quick History of Belarus, Spader Valdemar's video, Why Don't Belarusians Speak Belarusian, Stratford's video, Belarus's Geographic Challenge, The Marxist Project's video, The Fate of Belarus, Timothy Snyder's book, The Reconstruction of Nations, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, and Belarus, TLDR News EU video, Europe's Last Dictatorship, Belarus Election Explained, YouTube's video, Lukashenko's Belarus and the Great Patriotic War, Vice News Documentary, Europe's Last Dictatorship, VPRO World News Documentary, Inside Europe's Last Dictatorship, and finally, Wikipedia.